Uh, this is Mitch Weisberg here for HeadChat Interactive. And with me is Chris Crowell from Toronto. And Chris is gonna be talking about how the structure of games is actually a teaching paradigm. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of similarities, similarities between what games, uh, how games work and how, uh, how people learn. So Chris, um, I, you know, I saw that one of your slides is really introducing right. yourself. So rather than me tell everybody how phenomenal you are and how everybody <laughs> in the gaming community looks up to you, um, I'm going to let you um, introduce yourself. Well, that's, thanks, Mitch. I appreciate that. Hi, everyone. Thanks for, for turning out. And welcome to everybody else who comes in in, in progress. Um, yeah, so let me just, uh, you know, I put together a deck to kind of go through, touch on the things that we wanted to touch on. So let me just go ahead and do that. And part of that is explaining who I am and uh, what, what the goal is. So I think one of the reasons that we're here and that we're interested in this field is, uh, is, is relevant to this quote. So I'm not always ready to learn. I'm always ready to learn, although I do not always like being taught. And I think that this is, I think it's always been true, but it's never been more true than now uh, because of the way that uh, just our whole society has changed and paradigm shift in terms of agency and do it yourself and the internet and all the other things that the modern era has for us. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about talk about those things and, and see where games can fit into this. So we'll start off with the introduction to say like, who's this guy? Um, I'm Chris Wombat Kroll. I've been doing game design and creative direction since 1994 when I went to work for Electronic Arts. Uh, I've worked at Maxis and Ubisoft and a lot of other game studios. I did that for 20 years. And over time, I came to realize that games are uh, a really, uh, really strong teaching uh, uh, paradigm, as, as Mitch said, that over the course of games, uh, during gameplay, players learn all about what the game is trying to teach them, and that there's, there's a way for us to, uh, to leverage the power of games to teach people about real world things and real world knowledge. And so, uh, hey, I managed to misspell something right in there while I was talking about educators. So. I, I quit my regular uh, education, uh, entertainment games gig and started Kroll Interactive specifically to use what I know about game development and game design to work with educators to bring in this whole new generation of uh, educational games. And one, of the, things that, teaching. one of the that? things that I forgot to bring up is that you're also a featured speaker at the Serious Play Conference, which is going to be in Florida in right. June. Yes, I'm running a workshop. I actually have a slide at the end. Okay. I'll go ahead and uh, I'll throw that up at some point. <laughs> but yeah, so I run a workshop uh, where I run educators through the process of just taking an idea for a game and creating what I call an ugly prototype over the course of a few hours, um, just to really give everyone the experience and show them there's a proven process to take an idea and actually end up with a workable game um, at the end of it. And so um, it's, it just sort of breaks those chains on any educator who really wants to, to move forward and to, you know, to, to get their hands dirty with games on their own. And so over the course of talking with Mitch about this, I wanted to be uh, clear about what is my wheelhouse? What do I have expertise in? Um, I mingle a lot with educators and very, very smart people. Um, and so what I am, uh, what I have expertise in and, and experience in is game design, educational game design, um, game development processes in general, and project management. Um, so I can speak with authority on all of those things. Um, not so much on academic studies. So if you ask me about some study that somebody had done, I don't, there's a good chance I'm not going to know about that. I'm not a researcher. Um, and I'm also not doing game-based learning in a classroom. There are other teachers who are buddies of mine who are using games in their classrooms nearly every day, but I'm not one of them and I do not hold myself up to have anywhere near the level of experience that those guys do. And I, we're working on getting some of them in here uh, for future webinars, but that sort of scopes what I'm, what I'm, uh, I'm here to talk about. Okay, so let's talk about <coughs> games and education. And, um, 
I think this is interesting just even now we have, hey, hey I, I see Keith Fuller's in. Hi, Keith. Um, th that we have this digital e-learning paradigm that we're, that we're engaged in right now, right? And um, unfortunately, it's, we're still going a, a little bit of old school here where there's a talking head at the front of the class and uh, I'm going through a slide deck and I'm, I'm sort of like this is kind of the lecture mode part of the evening. Um, and hopefully I get through this and we get to a more interactive modality. And we're gonna talk about why that's, why that's good, um, you know, where we're gonna get there. So I'd like to start with fundamentals. And so I wanna talk about the role of education, at least from my point of view, which is uh, quoting Martin Luther King, function of education is therefore to teach one to think intensively and think critically. And what reading, what a lot of different people had to think about the role of education, the way I see it and talk with educators is to prepare the student for participation in society um, and teaching, passing along essential information and skills so that they can just get out and become a member of society. And so uh, society continues to evolve and I'm sure, fairly sure that almost everybody who's, who's uh, paying attention right now is familiar with the, the notion of the 21st century competencies. Different regions have their own different flavor of these sort of commandments for, for what students need to be uh, competent in coming into this new era of technology. But this is what Ontario has. <coughs> and so I'll have, you know, just looking at these things, this isn't, sort of, it's not necessarily STEM, it's not uh, the old math and writing and English and all these kinds of things. It's a whole new different kind of, of a skill sets for, uh, for students to, to gain. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, sort of knowledge of how to think um, and also socio-emotional learning where uh, that whole notion of, of collaboration with other people and citizenship and participation is, uh, is being passed along also. And games are very well, very well situated to uh, give students experiences in these different categories, especially guided experiences by educators. And so on the left-hand side here, I sort of have the old paradigm, right, where we have a talking head or, or some source of knowledge which then passes this information one way to the students, or the learners, I should say. <clears throat> and then on the right, we have more of the modern era where things, there's just a, uh, there's a nexus of, or an ecosystem of information available out there through all these different kinds of channels. And the learner is at the center of that. And they're very self-actualized. They're, they're reaching out, they're in control, they're driving where they're going for information, how they choose to consume it. And so we wanna uh, make sure that uh, you know, this is the new paradigm and uh, games are definitely part of that because it's an intensely interactive paradigm. So <clears throat> the notion of agency and responsibility, the core element of games is this notion of agency where the player is in control. The player makes choices, makes meaningful choices. They understand what's taking place there um, and they, they choose an action, they perform that action and there, things happen as a result of that action. And so there's no avoiding the responsibility for these acts that they take, that they, uh, that they do. And this is just built into the nature of gameplay. And every gamer understands that everything they do has, a, has an impact, it has a repercussion, and it will affect their ability to succeed or fail. And so this is part of sort of the innate, implicit nature of games. That, uh, that is passed along. Just by playing a game, you learn this is how things work. And so this is a great uh, notion to carry forward into the real world. But Critical also, uh, but I would say also with that agency in games is the reduced risk, right? Yes. Because you, you take agency in the real world and if you fail, there's mm -hmm. some, there can be some incredibly bad negative consequences. Right. Whereas in a game, it's like, well, you know, maybe you lost an hour or two hours, but you can restart the game, right? Right. I think I actually have a slide on that. So uh, yeah, this just, it creates a safe space to, to experiment and, and, and try things out. Um, if I don't have a slide, we'll certainly talk about it. And I should put a slide in there. I'm pretty sure I've got something along those lines. Okay. 
the notion of critical thinking and problem solving is implicit to games. That is the very nature of a game experience is to face a series of challenges and, and overcome them in pursuit of a goal. And so um, there's a, 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 a sort of a fundamental interactivity loop that I'll go over later in this presentation that is part and parcel of the nature of a, of a gameplay experience where you are observing and analyzing what you see, you make a plan, you execute the plan, something happens as a result of the execution of your plan and you learn, okay, when I do this, that happens. And now the whole world state has updated and you start again uh, determining, okay, now what should I do in order to reach my goals? So this is just a great way to approach all kinds of problem solving in games and it's totally extensible into the real world. And so just by playing games, you learn to have this approach. And what, what's useful about using games in a classroom is that the teacher can then help bridge that gap between what's happening in the game and through discussion and, and, and further kinds of, of, uh, of exercises and reflections, the student can see how their approach in the game is relevant to problem solving in the real world. And this is really where we are with the modern era um, with you know, it, uh, intelligence being a key attribute for, of, for the workforce is that's what we do is we go out there and we problem solve every day in, in the, work, in the uh, workplace. And so this is a, a key thing that we need. The notion of mastery of a skill. Um, you cannot gain mastery of something just by hearing somebody talk about it. You can gain some little, depending on how much imagination you have, you can understand a bit of sort of the premise of where it's coming from, but games give you the ability to actually practice the skill. So this is a screenshot from a game that I worked on at TVO where we were working on using a protractor. And we came up with the idea of using the angles on the protractor to navigate a boat. There's actually a trash boat that goes out into the Ottawa River every year to pick up trash in the river. And so this is based on a real world activity, which is context, narrative context that we have in this game, this mini game that we've got in the, in, uh, the TVO Empower math suite. And so you are actually using the protractor and learning how to use the protractor not in this very abstract way on a worksheet, but you're actually using it to navigate a boat on the river. And so it takes that notion of these math problems and puts it in this living context and therefore it has much more meaning and it's just cemented a lot better in a student's brain. Resilience or grit is something else that is just part so, as a virtual reality, games offer a safe space to experiment. So here's the slide we were uh, talking about. So this notion that there is this freedom to just try again, um, as opposed to simply absorbing the correct answer that's given to you uh, from the front of a class, is really one of the big powers of, of a game experience, where you can say, well, what if I went off and did this other thing, these other things that, that you wanted to do? And I think if we all think back to our childhood, we certainly had those thoughts in our head where when somebody was telling us to do something or telling us to believe something or that something was true, we would go and think about the alternatives to that and wonder about that. And so this is uh, a game space is a place where a student can say, well, I'm going to try to do this, not the way you told me to do it and see what happens. Um, and so as, as Mitch was saying, this doesn't cost a trip to the emergency room, it doesn't cost, you know, whatever it costs to replace an exploded rocket or any of the other kinds of things. Uh, maybe there's social scenarios that you want to experiment with as you're, as you're a, a teenager who's learning how, you know, how to talk with other people and understand, you know, why, why being rude can, can give you negative, uh, negative uh, responses. These are all safe places to try these things out and just see sort of Find out more about yourself by experimenting in these places and also find out more about how the world works. Failure also is super important in terms of understanding the way rules work. Metrics and assessment. So <clears throat> there's another thing that can happen with digital games is that they can be designed in such a way as to capture the gameplay metrics to show 
the, the comprehension or comprehension sort of activities of, of the learners in action as, as these concepts are being used. Um, and so this is radically different than say giving someone a quiz afterwards um, because this is actually seeing them in use. So there's almost kind of a constant quizzing going on depending on how that you know you need the proper game design to make this work right but you can capture these metrics and bring them to a dashboard and run a, you know a little bit of analysis on that and certainly uh, one of the things that a teacher can see is sort of like where is the student proficient and where are they having problems and you can also see that across the entire classroom so this is just one of the other kinds of things is that you have this sort of real time metrics gathering sort of a low level almost artificial intelligence analysis of all these different play sessions that are going on so you can have a whole classroom full of kids or students playing a game or in interacting with some sort of learning uh, learning program and just get that popping up it's as if they have a teacher standing behind them watching them uh, to help them and be ready to step in so as a teacher, this really helps you identify sort of what are your hot spots and areas of concern and where are the places where you just know that people are doing well. <clears throat> so that's sort of popping it back to the teacher. Um, there's also the opportunity within the game experience to under the hood be doing dynamic differentiation where we are running analysis um, of how the, the learner is, is doing by you know interacting with these different concepts and using these different concepts and so you can build these little logic trees under the hood to throw up uh, scaffolding helpful you know uh, provide helpful hints if the if the learner seems to be struggling or you can even just say all right great and just kind of take them back to a more remedial portion of the learning curve where the, the fundamentals are being reintroduced against because they missed something um, and let them go back and practice that again and kind of come back up the the uh, the stream of learning to <coughs> to reach that point and then of course if it looks like they're really struggling then and you have a dashboard attached then that can pop up to the teacher so they can come and give hands on but the the underlying system the 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 computer program can analyze the play play metrics and do some kind of basic, almost a, you know, a TA administration to help guide the learner to the right level of uh, uh, right level of challenge in, in, in their their mastery of the concepts. And of course, um, I'm I'm aware of the growth mindset. I had an educator bring this to my attention. Um, I'm not an expert on this, but it's I, I definitely can understand that the growth mindset is is uh, something that games foster um, that uh, the whole the whole way games are structured is to continually challenge the player to learn and understand the new things that are being presented to them and that's really sort of the fundamental structure of the growth mindset um, <coughs> where you're you're you want to trigger that endorphin rush of learning something new and really kind of have fun with that and so that's a big part of what the power of games can bring to an educational uh, state is that it, it, it allows the player to, or the learner to progress at, at a pace that's comfortable for them and to really learn to cherish the notion of pushing forward and learning new things and taking on the right kinds of challenges. Um, and ideally, if it's tuned properly, it's sort of like uh, Goldilocks where it's not too hard and it's not too soft, it's just right. And with that dynamic differentiation, we can tune the gameplay experiences to provide exactly the right level of challenge based on each individual learner's uh, comprehension of the concepts. And educators okay. might call that the zone of proximal development. There you go. <laughs> That's, uh, I've still, I, I've heard that terminology before. I'm not an educator, so I don't have all the jargonation. Uh, I, I, you know, I can say uh, pedagogy now and not embarrass myself. So I, I've made it to that point. But that was a, a big culture shift for me coming out of game studios and, and working with educators is that there are a lot of these big terms that um, 
that are, are very useful for, for designers working with educators. And I love Peter's comment, uh, or I think if that's how you pronounce your name, uh, ga game designers tend to refer to it as, as being in flow or the flow channel. Yes, that is correct. Sorry, I don't, what, how, I don't, however I'm supposed to have this set up, I'm not seeing the chat. So yeah, Mitch, if you want to pass along any chat notes to me, that, that'd be great. Or sure. people are well, well are, are welcome to unmute themselves and, and ask a question in, in here, right? Like I'm yeah. kind of going through these things. I'm not in a total flow state myself, so um, I'm happy to stop and, and discuss things in more detail. In, in the spirit of, uh, of gamers, we want to give everybody agency. Yeah, everybody, that's it. I mean, I'm all about interactivity and interactive learning. And so please, please make this interactive if, you, if you're feeling inspired to do so. Okay, on interactivity. So that was sort of uh, the whole first section there was, um, was sort of the state of education and in general, what, what do games possess that make them uh, a valuable tool? towards that. And I also want to just say, you know, winding up that section, I, I do not believe games are a silver bullet um, that, oh, right, get rid of all the teachers and have nothing but games and everyone will come out as some sort of well-educated genius. But I do believe that games um, and this notion of interactivity and the flipped classroom to give the, the students agency is a super valuable tool in the educator's toolkit uh, to use in addition to lectures and all the other kinds of things, some of the more traditional kinds of education. So I'm a big fan of mixing it all in and using what makes sense, you know, the right tool for, for the kind of job that you want to do. And I just want to sort of help people understand what, where games, you know, why would you use a game tool as opposed to some other kind of tool? And so let's talk about what is good about education uh, or interactivity in general in games in particular. Okay, interactivity <laughs> is acting on or in close relationship with each other. I didn't really like that definition too much because I think um, what's essential with interactivity is that you've engaged in a meaningful way. Um, so I'll just read sort of what I have here, which is a process where the player deliberately performs a game action in pursuit of a goal that changes something in the game state. So if I had a button in a game that you could just click on constantly and it did nothing, that's not truly interactive. That's just, it's just a, a, a it, it's a pretend interactivity. So the, the, the notion of interactivity is that you are making something happen by engaging with it, as opposed to looking at something on TV or watching a movie or reading a book. Those are very linear um, and the only interactivity you have in those, in those cases typically is to turn it on or off, pick it up or put it down. Um, games, a game experience doesn't happen until the player engages with the game. And then you create this experience. It's a cooperative creation. Um, and every game experience is unique to the player on that particular playthrough. And so that's something that's very powerful. And, you know, I think that there's a lot of resonance with real life where our lives are these unique constructs that we have as we interact with the world. And so games are these sort of miniaturized, controlled little mini lives that players can choose those little experimental spaces uh, to try out new things and to learn, learn things. And so there was a great comment I, or, uh, from uh, Gerald Hounst, I hope I pronounced your name right, that too many educational games reduce learning to the acquisition of a collection of fragmented skills that are sequenced arbitrarily from easiest to hardest, and that what he's interested in is how game structure can get us to deeper, more sophisticated learning. Yes. Okay. Um, if we make it to the third part of this slide deck, then we'll, we'll go through that, which is specifically how to design for educational games. Um, so I'll try to be less verbose here and, and, and move a little faster, right? So it sort of touched on this, right? Like, so looking at a painting is not, is not interactive. Watching a program TV, not interactive. Piloting an aircraft, absolutely interactive, right? Like the plane won't fly generally speaking, you know, the autopilots aside, you need to interact with the controls 
to make it uh, to to uh, to make the plane fly. And so there's a, a cycle of uh, of activity phases of an interaction. And so this is something that I put together as I was trying to come up with a tool to debug broken game experiences. Then it has proven to be really, really valuable. And I, if, if nothing else, I wanted to pass this on to the people who are watching. Um, so there's <coughs> stages of interactivity happen in four phases. And the first thing that happens is observation. Um, and I'll get into e each of these in a little bit more detail. So we've got observation, where you try to make sense of what you're seeing and understand what your goals are. And then you've got planning, where you're going to say, all right, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, execution, where you do, you execute your plan and you do what it is, that, that, whether it's very, very simple or, or complicated. And then something happens as a result of you taking that action. And then it changes the world and you start all over again with the observation. So let's go through these in a little bit more detail. All right, so as a designer, you must plan for all four stages. Um, and at the end, if you have a game experience where something feels off, it just feels flat or it's confusing, um, thinking about this loop will help you spiral in on, on figuring out what's, what's missing, what, what isn't working right. So let's take a look at these things. So in observation, the player must be able to perceive and to make sense of what they're perceiving. So I love to use chess because it's such a, such a great game. It's been around for thousands of years. It's still here, virtually unchanged. So obviously it's got something going on with it. Um, and one of the great things is you can look at a game board and understand the state of all those pieces. Even if you don't really know where everything's gonna go, you know where things stand right now. Um, so the factors that can uh, complicate the observation are the complexity of the game state, um, changes to the elements within the game, the uh, uh, knowledge of the elements, how much do you know about those pieces? Like if I come back up here and I look at a chessboard, maybe I only know what half those pieces do. I can't, I have in incomplete comprehension of, of what I'm looking at, right? And so maybe what I would be doing then is my game state is I'm going to experiment with the pieces and see what each one does before I launch into my grand strategy of how to actually win the game. I need to know what my pieces do before I can get in and, and, and just sort of reasonably proceed towards my, my final goal. Um, or you can have limited viewing. If the, like the game on the right here has got a fog of war type of a thing where you don't get to see the entire world you have this sort of zone of visibility around you. So this is something that game design can use <coughs> um, to, to make it harder for players or make it easier for players. Um, and so just, just a notion that this is a thing, this is the first stage of the interactivity. The second stage is planning. So the player must be able to understand at least some of their choices and be able to predict the potential results, or at least try to predict the potential results. So I can look at a chessboard, I can know that the pieces, I know how these pieces move, and I can start thinking, well, if I move here, what might happen if I move this piece, if I move this piece, right? Um, and then eventually, I, I sort of run through my choices, I evaluate those pros and cons, I decide what am I gonna do, and the end is I'm gonna end up making a choice and I'm going to move towards the execution phase. It's like, all right, out of all my choices, I'm going to do this thing. And the factors that might go into that choice of like, how many choices do I have? Typically in good design, you don't want to overwhelm the player with just a universe of choices and have analysis paralysis, um, but you don't want too few either because then you may feel like you're being railroaded. Um, how much time do you have to make the choice? Is there a timer going? to create a stress there, or do they just have as much time as they want? Difficulty of the actions that you're going to perform. In chess, the, there's no, not really a lot of skill involved. You just move a piece on the, on the, on the chessboard. Um, whereas if you were playing golf, you might really evaluate which shot you're gonna try to take based on you know, how well you think you can take that shot. Um, so, and there's where your player skill comes into it. And is it moving you towards the goal? or not? Is this gonna, gonna help you win or not? So these are the kinds of things that goes to a player, the, the, the player's mind as they're playing. Um, 
and then you use the skill to execute the plan. Um, so <clears throat> it's pretty straightforward with chess. You just move it. If you failed at that, I'm not sure what I can say to you. Um, but there are a lot of games that have a lot of great skill-based execution challenges, right? So like a driving game, you've got steering and braking and acceleration. In a platforming game, you've got jumping and shooting. Playing tennis, you've got timing and movement. And even with Pictionary, you have this like this challenge. You have to execute a drawing. Uh, everyone who's ever tried to play Pictionary has certainly had the experience where you have the idea of exactly what you want, and then you just draw some formless blob that no one on your team can possibly uh, can possibly analyze. And so, all these these are different uh, the various kinds of things. Now, because we're talking about serious games and educational games, generally speaking this execution phase really needs to be very carefully considered. It's a lot of, it's, there's a lot of fun potential to it, but the goal of an educational game is to create a, a, a situation where the, the learner must exhibit skill in the concept that's being presented, and that's what determines whether they succeed or fail. So if you had, say, driving around in a game that was, uh, I don't know, about language skill, and it was a race, you, your language doesn't really help you win or lose in that. It could be incidental and part of sort of the context of the actual gameplay activity, but the best kinds of game-based game learning is where the execution of the concept is the core, and that's what determines whether you succeed or fail. It would be really miserable to be excellent at learning the new language but bad at racing and therefore lose in this language game. Okay. So <clears throat> the factors in execution are the skills and resources of the player, the skills and resources of any other players, the inherent difficulty of using the game interfa interface for that action, and the complexity of the game world elements. Okay. Everybody. So I'll have these slides available for people later if they're interested. Okay, and then the final stage, but like all four of these stages are essential, and this is one that often doesn't get the love that it deserves, is the feedback phase, where the player can see, but like the game speaks loudly to the player to say, hey, your action caused this thing to happen. Um, and that's what tells the player, was that, that action loop successful? Was it, did it move me towards my goals? Did it move me away from my goals? Did I succeed? Did I fail? Am I good at this or not? Um, and it updates their library of patterns, which will come into play as, the, as they go back through the, the stages again um, and, 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 and start observing and making plans and all the rest of it, right? But like all that, that knowledge of the patterns plays into both of those things there to know what they're looking at and what they're capable of. Okay, so if there is no feedback, the player will feel that the work they did was pointless or that their choice was invalid or that the game has a bug. And all of those things cause the player to break out of the immersion of, you know, they, 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 they pull back from that interactive flow and they start staring at the screen as opposed to being part of the game world. And so, all of these things here, this notion of feedback is really essential. Um, and it's one of the, it's actually where the teaching happens in each of these loops, okay? So you finish that, you get the feedback, the world changes, the player's understanding changes, and now the player's you know, looking at this new game world with a new understanding of how things work and voila, back into the next loop again, right? So it's just these series of loops, and these can go very, very quickly. Um, whether you're just kind of clicking through buttons in the game menu to see what each one of those does, whether you're creating a character, you're talking to a, a NPC, which is a non-player character in the game, whether you're surviving the next three seconds by hiding or shooting or running, um, trying to you know jump properly to get to the bonus at the end of the jumping level, or outside of that, talking and planning with another player, right? So every human interaction that we have has that same kind of a thing going on. Whatever your goals are for talking, my goals right now in talking to everybody here in this, in this webinar 
are communicating these ideas. And I've got these little loops of each slide is kind of a loop where I'm, I'm giving you something new to observe. I'm giving you information about it so you understand it. Um, you're, you're not really interacting with it, but <clears throat> it's, it's got kind of a truncated loop in terms of just sort of picking up the new information. Actually, and there have been some really good comments as you were talking. Oh, please. So, um, so one is that, you know, that as you were going through these four different stages, mm -hmm. um, these are the stages that you, that the game player or that the learner goes through. Mm -hmm. And so therefore what you're really addressing is that we want to create learning activities that have the same level of engagement as games. And this yes. is how we should think about those learning activities and make sure that they have a time for a person to observe, plan, do, and get feedback. Absolutely. Thank you, Mitch. Yes, that is correct. I'm, I, I'm trying to, to go fast so that we have time to talk, but yes, thank you for summarizing that. That's the practical application of this, of this theoretical framework. Um, and it's, it's, I, I call it a theoretical framework, but it's real. This is truly how things go. Um, and yes, as you're, as you're designing games or you're thinking about using games um, and you have a learning cycle where you want to, to uh, have your, your learners encounter some new concept and, and do things with it, you kind of, they need to have the timing and the, the opportunity to do these things properly. And in the case, you know, depending on the kinds of things you're trying to teach, but typically time pressure wouldn't be part of that, right? Um, most of the kinds of educational things we have, we, it, if there is time pressure, it should be kind of a gentle time pressure. Um, to, so that they have time to really let it sink in and understand it and go through the planning. And ideally, they have the agency to say, all right, take me to the next step. All right, I'm going to try to use this now and, and sort of step through these things. You know, we have some military people at the Serious Games, and maybe they have different time pressure constraints than someone who's teaching a college class or teaching a high school class, right? That, that they're actually trying to teach their learners to make these decisions under pressure um, and to do it quickly and to go with that. So just what I want to do is just sort of show this framework and talk about the different kinds of parameters that might be at play in each one of these phases, um, whether you're hiding the information um, or making it wide open or, or any, uh, any of these other kinds of things. As whoever is thinking of, of implementing these games or designing new games, these are things that you should be thinking about. Okay, so the summary of this is the interactions take place in four stages. The game must support the player in all the stages. Uh, that's how the learning can happen. <clears throat> and if you run into a game or learning paradigm, you can kind of use this to, to diagnose what's going on. So if, if, the, if the learner cannot tell what's going on or they're getting frustrated because yeah, they, they just can't make sense of it, then you've got a problem in the observation phase. Um, so, so as an example, in a in a in school, if yeah. um, if a student is sitting there and there's a lecture, there's really not not nothing for the student to then figure out what right. is going on and what they should do next. There's nothing for them to plan because they're sitting back and just getting that information. Um, yes. They, the, by the time they do the execution, which is taking a test, um, the learning has already taken place in the past. And by the time they get their feedback, they couldn't have, they can't do anything to reinforce their learning because the, the teacher's already moving on to the next right. um, point. And so if we wanted, we really designed our standard or, or uh, old learning system in a way that's designed, that, that's um, opposite of, of the way the, the brain works. Right. So if we go back to this first slide here to talk about the observation phase, they have to be able to see it. Now you could throw things up there and you could hear the teacher talking, but they can't make sense of what they're perceiving, right? Like there's no relevance to it. They don't understand why is this person telling me these things? What possible relevance does this have to my life? Um, and that's one of the great things about a game paradigm is that you can, as part of sort of the narrative structure, is that you can have a point to the concept being communicated, right? So in the example I had, we have this little boat, we need to navigate the boat, and therefore we're gonna use this protractor and the angles to navigate the boat. Oh, 
okay, I get that, right? If I just held up a protractor in front of a class of students and said, here's this protractor and it's got these angles on it. Like, okay, thanks. What is, you know, like I got a lot of things in my life. Why are you telling me about this right now? Like there's no, like I don't see a point to this. And that's part of the, the notion of agency, which is having the, the, the ability to make these meaningful choices is that games create a meaning in and of themselves just because a game always has an ultimate goal of winning or at least you know of, of always winning and the the anti goal of not losing um, and so you already now have a bit of a point to it if this is the thing you need to, to, to learn and we see this in every single game education uh, or entertainment game that's out on the marketplace right like there's no no real world relevance to those kinds of things but people grab on to those goals because my god the world is confusing is, is have we lived in a more confusing time in the last in my lifetime i don't know we're certainly in the middle of a very confusing scenario in the real world and so a game paradigm has sensible things going on and you understand your goals and you understand even if you don't really know what your goals are that the game is a safe place for you to experiment and at some point you have faith because it's a designed experience, you have faith that you will uncover uh, what the goals are, what the actual win condition is, and understand the kinds of things you need to do in order to be successful. So and and I'm looking at the time, and, I, and oh, I've yeah. seen your slides later on. Okay. There are some questions about you know, deep learning and assessment, mm -hmm. and those slides really address those, the, a lot of those issues. So okay. as you know, like- How am I doing that? Oh my God. Right. right, I'm so torn because to me this is fascinating, but okay. I know that that other people are interested in the deep learning. So, well, Mitch, why don't you point me where um, this was sort of the, the main thing I wanted to get to uh, in the the actual game design? That loop I think is really really essential and is one of the biggest most helpful things um, to understand what the game experience is. So, I'd be happy to respond to to comments and questions right now, and and I can I can bounce around in the in the PowerPoint to. To get to uh, well, I liked some of the points that things. you made in the other in the slides that follow this about okay, um, you know how do you you know how do you build the games so that well there's a question here from uh, Peter or Pieter, um, mm -hmm. you know uh, games that ha that where the end condition is not necessarily defined or games where deep learning takes place or games you know um, how do you build an assessment and, and there are things that you so I, I think those slides were great. Okay. Uh, well, let's just step through these then and uh, see what we can do. So um, this is part of a pitch deck that I, 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 I presented at a Unity conference to talk to designers about how to work with educators. So there's a little bit of that flavor still in here. Um, so let's go ahead. So Ray, let's talk about the difference between a regular game and an educational game. I'll talk fast. Um, regular games, you play the game, you learn about the stuff in the game, you get good, you beat the game, you know game stuff. In an educational game, you play the game, you learn about the curriculum in the game, you get good at the curriculum, you beat the game, and now you know about the educational stuff. Okay, so that's sort of the thing. In a regular game, you're doing fun things. Um, in, uh, in an educational game, the approach is to start with your learning outcomes first. Know what it is that this game is supposed to teach this, this, the, the learner. Um, are you talking about math? Are you talking about social emotional learning? Are you talking about art history? Know up front what it is. You cannot succeed uh, at your task until you know what it is that you're trying to accomplish. And so this is a big part of what's needed with an educational game experience. What is the learning outcome you're trying to achieve? And then you can guide any kind of game design or any analysis of the game experience towards helping the student understand the correlation between what the game is doing and what it is, this real world learning outcome that you're trying to achieve. Um, understand who your audience is. It, <coughs> it ranges completely, right? Is it a bunch of adults? Is it kids? Um, try to find out a bit about that. There's just all kinds of stuff that you can think about this in terms of developing persona stereotypes, for the different kinds of, of learners and the different kinds of players and all that. It's, it's important to know that the educator can set the parameters 
on what it is that you're trying to do, and the designer will think of what's suitable for that demographic. Um, we've got Piaget stages of development, right, which I'll just sort of have that there. If you don't know what this is, go ahead and look it up. Uh, it's great stuff for anyone who's working with, with designs. Um, now, this is a thing that occurred to me while I was working with educators to, to develop games. Um, initially, I sort of turned my nose up at these very, very simple games um, that didn't really force you to master a concept in order to succeed at the games. Um, and, and then I, I kind of backed off and then I realized that there is, there's this sort of axis of mastery. So as you're building your game, you need to understand just how hardcore are you trying to make the learning in this game experience? Are you just trying to make people generally aware that, boy, uh, biological diversity of animals in the wild is, under, is, is threatened and it's a really good thing to have lots of biological diversity? Or are you really trying to teach people how to run a zoo? Uh, or a wildlife conservation area themselves, right? And, and so just knowing up front that this is what you're trying to do with this game experience is very important to know up front. <coughs> How will the game be used? Is it uh, collectively done in a classroom with say a teacher up front and the whole class participating as a group exercise? Is it individually done? Is it going to be a physical, uh, uh, analog game or is it going to be a digital game, right? Like how is all that going to work? So just sort of think about that as you're putting your game idea together. Um, <clears throat> the more mastery you're trying to achieve in your learning outcome, the more the success in the game experience must come from using the concept. And this is just another one of this is just a drum I beat constantly when we're talking about educational games and game-based learning in particular. You can use general gamification concepts like points and badges and, uh, you know, like merit badges and, and, and these kinds of, of sort of game frameworks to kind of give a lollipop to students when they do the regular classroom work. Um, and that's, that's okay as kind of an external motivator, but it's much more efficacious to actually build the mastery of using the concept into the actual gameplay so that the student has to use that, really use it and understand its use in, a, in, a, in a, uh, uh, an interesting dynamic uh, uh, situation where you can succeed and you can fail. Okay, the, ide the ideal learning flow, this is something we've discovered in working on learning games, is we start off with an introduction to the concept. So we sort of explain it and let the player get used to just knowing, oh, that's what this is about. Um, and then you show it, you model how to use the concept. Um, and in both of these cases, if this was a classroom, this could either be done in a game, all, these, all three of these phases, or you could be lecturing to explain the concept. And also as part of your lecture, you could be modeling how to use it. And then the third part where you're actually, the player is using the concept, that's where a game for sure is very, very powerful. And we let the, the, the learner use that concept and, and experiment with it and try to succeed or fail with it. So if you have failure, uh, you can analyze the results. And if it's close to being successful, you can then trigger some scaffolding opportunities to pop up. I try not to impose that on, on players. I like to make it available, right? Because there's nothing worse than trying to figure something out and you think you have it and then some helpful little piece of software pops up the solution, the answer right in front of you, right as you think you had the answer. Um, my typical solution is to put up the opportunity for them to get that answer or to get that help um, when they feel like they're ready to do it. Just kind of make that, that, that available and then they can try again. If you've got big, big fails or repeated fails, maybe consider a, sort of an under the hood, sliding them back to an earlier section of the whole, that whole paradigm um, and <laughs> let them try it again. And gamers, get this. This is how games work. You, you constantly push forward in a game till you hit a part that gets too hard and then you, you try to push a little bit and then maybe you'll bounce back and you get better at it and you learn more and then you come back and try to take that challenge on over again. Educators, 
really, really hate this. Um, and I understand as a parent, you feel really, it's, it's hard to watch your kids or the people that your learners failing, but they, uh, uh, provided that all that whole, that whole loop is there for them to understand why they failed, that the feedback is, is, is good, maybe they were just experimenting with things, they don't mind trying and trying and trying again um, because that's fun and it makes, it makes overcoming the challenge worth it at the end. If it's too easy, it's not worth it. And so, if it's too hard, it can be frustrating. Yes. So there is, so um, there's, there's actually, you know, Gerald had a, another interesting mm -hmm. comment that there are other models of, of instruction that reverse that sequence. That they really? Let the, right, that they let the, the player explore first mm -hmm. or backfilling with the explanation. Okay. Okay, That's and, you, and game, some games do that also. You, know, yeah. you try something and you don't get the explanation until you... Um, you know, try to cook a couple things, right? Yeah, I. You know what? I think that that's that's perfectly valid. It's very dramatic, right? So, um, all this is sort of a, a default flow, which I think that if you go this way, this is a very comfortable flow for learners. Um, and if you want to try to experiment around and flip it and, and do something very dramatic just almost as a, as a, you're throwing the gauntlet at their feet, right? And saying, okay, that's right. I just made you fail, but I'm giving you, this just means that you need to go off and become better, right? And learn, learn some of these things. And then you can go back and challenge this again. That's almost a narrative structure approach to things where now you've got this big bad guy at the beginning, um, this big challenge that you know that you can't, you can't overcome it. It seems really big. And, and then you have to go up and have a training montage uh, where you become awesome. And then it feels really good to come back and re-encounter that challenge again and overcome it. And so that's a, that's a, a narrative thing. And that's like sort of advanced game design. You absolutely can do it. Um, but like, I'm just trying to lay out the fundamentals here. Like sort of like this is sort of the ABC version, um, not the backwards alphabet. But there's, there's actual, I mean, there's lots of these things you can riff with. It's more of a jazz than any kind of hard set. This is what you must do. Um, that being said, that flow of interactivity, that's, that's a flow. Like that one doesn't really, it just happens that way. That's the way our brains work. Um, but yeah, this other part here in terms of, 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 of sending out that information is you could totally do that. It's great, great question. I hope people. Yeah, I thought it was a good question. Useful. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, so <clears throat> and I'm being very, uh, very emphatic with this stuff when I say don't. Um, this was my instruction to young designers uh, to really sort of break out of their comfort zone. So it's very easy for educators and designers to go with these kinds of old paradigms of the passive, you know, reading and listening, having multiple choice quizzes, um, delivering help without asking and dictating uh, to, to the learner. Um, these are, this is sort of old school and there, there's undoubtedly still places for it, but that's not what game-based learning is. Um, and you're losing all the power of agency. There's no agency with any of these things. Um, it's, just, it's just kind of a really easy way out. No matter whether you put badges or anything else around it, you're really not using the power of games to engage the learner. And that's really what we're trying to do here. And have so you what seen you, cases where the kids were involved in creating the game and did that help them learn? Absolutely. And I think that's part of this. And so, you know, that's, that's definitely a thing that, that Paul Darvasi has evolved into in his classroom uh, experiments. And so this is really, um, you know, this is true for the educators and for the, the, the student experience is to have it be interactive, uh, have it be experimental, um, have discovery. The, the, the person at the front can act as a guide, although it's really cool when players pick up enough, enough of their own, like as they pick up new information, there's a real pleasure to being the person who's knowledgeable enough to use your knowledge to help another learner overcome that challenge right like that's something that kids love to do i mean we all love to do it i'm, I'm doing it now because i love it 
Um, this is stuff I know. Um, and present challenges. Don't present solutions. Don't help them to just say, oh, here's, here's the solution. You know, teach, teach them to fish. Don't just hand them the fish. And that's really kind of the challenge of, and of the game. I'm based unmuting Kathleen Fuller. You uh, raised your sure. hand. So I'm, sure. I'm questioning you. So Kathleen, if you have a question. Hi, you, guys. Hi. Hi. Um, I wanted to say thank you for doing this, Chris, and sure. a long time no see. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, students being subject matter experts while using games in the classroom. Um, I taught a collaborative design with Minecraft class and it became that they helped each other out and kind of rotated through each other's like uh, groups in order mm -hmm. to say, hey, I need help with redstone and I need help with portaling. And they just kind of took over and I was just there just to like, mark yes. <laughs> so two things I want to say real quick. Number one, hi, Kathy. Uh, Mitch, Kathy is another one of those educators who's using games in her classroom. So hopefully you uh -huh. two can connect after this. And uh, maybe we'll get Kathy up here to, uh, to, to, to have a webinar sometime. Um, and yeah, that's, that's, that's a huge part of, of sort of the next ring of this game-based education is to allow the students, give the students agency to not only play that game, but to then show their own mastery by creating experiences for their, their fellow learners and to, to teach each other. That's just sort of a kind of a growing of the ecosystem. Um, and I really, I'm gonna have to put together sort of like stage two of this, of sort of the power of games and start talking more about that because it feels like there's a number of people in the audience who are uh, really kind of at that stage and like, okay, yeah, we get games, we like games. Just tell us how to do more with them. And that's definitely the right thing, right? Like it's, it's all about that flipped classroom and handing the stick of control to each student as opposed to continuing to wield it as the, as the instructor. What else we got? Uh, so there's been some talk about, uh, you know, that failure and, um, you know, and how games allow for failure and in classes, we typically don't allow for failure. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just looking back through some of the comments about uh, schools, some schools that uh, use, um, that are really, really the whole school is based on games. There was... Um, um, the one in New York, and I, it's 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 in here um, somewhere. But the uh, Institute but of Play, in, the Institute of Play, and then there's yeah. there's specific school, um, okay. uh, but also you know, and whether that's still in existence. And I don't, I know Institute of Play is not in existence, but I think right. the school might be. I think it um, is, yeah. Um, but um, have you heard results from schools like that, or have, have you you know have you seen? Um, have you seen students or kid, you know, kids learn a lot about subjects yes. uh, through games? And I, I, I'm, I'm thinking back to your uh, protractor example. Mm -hmm. Did kids get angles that they start understanding that better? Yeah. So there's, there's a whole uh, notion of project-based learning. And I think games are definitely a, a good part of that, where it is kind of the way that, that we've learned for most of human history is, is at the side of someone who's more experienced and they just, they would give the junior people tasks to do, right? Like you explain a bit and then you turn them loose and let them do the thing. Um, we see this all throughout nature and it's just, it's a, it's a really great way to, to, to go about things. And, and, and we see all mammals play games as part of the, the young learning how to, to become successful adults. Um, and so it, it, it's a good expansion for us to have that. And it's kind of funny that we had this industrial model for century, century and a half, and now it is being challenged again. Um, and so I don't have, I haven't done any actual research on the outcomes of those things, but I do have anecdotal, uh, uh, research of what I can say is that I took both of my sons out of school when they were in middle school 
and we did unschooling at the house, thanks to my wife. Uh, she did the research on this because I'm really not a research person. Um, and that whole thing is, is it's kind of game-based learning or project-based learning. Um, and it's absolutely learner-led. And so as human beings, we are naturally curious about any number of things. So we want to know how to do, how, how, how things work and how to reach various kinds of, of self-identified goals. And when you have these kinds of, of like, you know, experiential schools, we've seen that people, this, the, the, the students will just say, I want to know about this, and they will learn everything they need to learn in order to do the thing. If they're interested in creating a computer game or some sort of computerized functionality, they learn how to code, right? If you don't know, if you have no interest in doing that, and neither of my sons has any interest in doing any coding whatsoever, um, trying to make them, you know, is the proverbial, you know, horse that has no interest in drinking the water. They just don't want to do it. But man, anything that they did want to do, we facilitated that. We were the guide on the side and we helped them explore those spaces. As a result, both my sons on the first try got into the college programs of their choice. They're very well-spoken young men. They're very well-educated because they grew up in this modern era where you have the internet um, and all these opportunities for learning. If it's something that you're genuinely interested in, it's there. Um, and so it would not surprise, I would be very surprised if that game-based school didn't mirror those kinds of things. That's the stories I hear out of the unschooling uh, community. And community. To, to a certain extent when Paul uh, Davasi and mm -hmm. um, now I can't, I can't, John, 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 John Fallon, John Fallon yeah. uh, talk in, you know, towards the end of April that they're, you know, they'll be talking about a, a, a lot of those things. Right. I don't have the date. I don't have it up yet on uh, Edge Head Interactive. Right. But yeah. So, well so Paul, yeah, Paul had an interesting evolution. He started by just creating a game to fill the last couple of weeks of high school for his, you know, board and uh, just like can't wait to get out of school senior boys. Um, so he created a game. And it was such a huge hit. It was based off of interacting in a world of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And so all the students became inmates in this imaginary asylum that he set up in his high school classroom. And so he was the big nurse uh, who was you know, running, running the things. And so they got to experience, he's an English teacher, so uh, it's unsurprising that he does sort of this English exercise instead of just reading the book and writing a book report, which was an option, most of the students opted to become part of that world of the book and to walk in the steps of the characters in the book and to really understand what it is to live under an authoritarian regime like that, where you're completely controlled and told what to do and given these you know, Skinner box rewards and all these interesting things going on. So that was his first thing and it just, charged him up to the point where the last project that, I, that his, he had his students work on is they coded an alternate reality, like a, a VR game uh, based on locations around Toronto for the, um, oh, anyway, it's a, it's a comic book that's set here in Toronto. The name is escaping me right now, but th it was an entirely student run project and Paul just sort of facilitated and acted in an executive producer role to sort of give them goals and to oversee their progress. But they did everything. And they ended up creating a game. They created their own little game studio. They assigned each other the roles and they, they, they walked it through. So that's just a fantastic experience. Not only did they learn about the English subject matter of this comic book series that they were, that they were doing, they actually went out into Toronto and found the locations and they learned to code and to use a game engine and to create something that was usable by other people. It was just a fantastic experience. So another that's, that question is evolution. Yeah. So another question that came up is: Have you written a book? Which book? Have you written? Have you? Do you? Are no, you, I have not oh, written a book. Oh, darn! Yeah. I think I, there was there's a big demand for you to write a book. Okay. <laughs> okay. So well, I'll, think, I'll look into that. Okay. For next week, could you you know could you write a book? <laughs> sure. Okay. I mean, you know, you're no, stuck I, at home I, and yeah. 
Right. I, I'm, I'm a little busy translating all my <laughs> classes to an online format. Right. But um, after that, you know, when the semester's over, I'll, I'll look into that. I've been thinking about that. And this is probably the biggest, most comprehensive deck of concepts I've put together so far. There's one thing I definitely want to throw up here um, as kind of, because I think we're kind of a sign off point, right? Yeah. Um, this is just sort of the whole thing. And Confucius said it really, really well. And it just sort of shows that this kind of thinking is not new. This is not radical or, or, or kind of world breaking. This, this has been around for a long time. I hear and I forget. I see and I remember. I do and I understand. That is sort of the essence of why game-based learning is worth it to go the extra mile and figure out how to make these things happen. Because our goal as educators is to get that understanding light bulb going off above the heads of the students. And this is a powerful tool to help them achieve that. So if then, you're going to be teaching offline or online rather, yeah. then would it be possible for people to audit your course? Mm, it's through Sheridan College. Okay. So I don't, yeah, it's not like so they have I'm to on YouTube or something. Yeah, they'd have to, to do it that way. That would be amusing to have people do that. So right. I'm actually, I've, I've been, I, right now I'm just teaching classic game design to students who are mostly interested in going out and creating entertainment products. But there's definitely a strong handful who are very interested in using this in a serious game type of application and using what they know. Um, and it's like, yes, yeah, it's, it's the kind of thing that we can really see that there's a power to this and why are we here if not to kind of make, you know, leave it, leave this world better than we found it, right? Sort of the Boy Scouts mm -hmm. writ large, uh, the whole camping credo. What am I, so, okay. So, so and, and somebody pointed out Karen Schreier's book also, or books. Yes. So, um, and uh, Kurt uh, Squire and Mark Prinsky and some of the other, um, uh, you know, uh, game-based learning yes. experts. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, there's a, there's there's a number of books. Um, I don't know. Do we want to uh, basic? Well, I mean, Mitch, you you know these guys right very well, right? Right. So people can contact you if people want to contact me and see like who do I think is is, is inspirational. Um, they're welcome to do so. I've got my contact info there. So anybody who would like to, uh, you know, touch base with right, them, and you've all gotten emails from me. That's yeah. how you. That's how you got on here. So um, Ryan Schaff is another really good author on right. game-based learning. Yeah. Um, so um, yeah, so here's your, you know, actually, you know, your contact information, people can meet yeah. you on uh, Facebook, on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um, they could uh, sign up for Serious Play. Yeah. Um, that would be, that's going to be a blast. It's, you know, I've run this workshop several times now, and it is always so, so fun. Um, and people come in very skeptical that, oh, they don't know how to make a game. And then you can sort of see the engagement for the picture here. They're, we're just making, it's not about making something beautiful. It's about making something that's really fun and engaging that also transmits that learning outcome. And I know out of the last one, we, the last series play we had in Orlando, there was a group of medical educators put together uh, a game for, uh, to teach uh, beginning nursing students, I believe, kind of mm -hmm. sort of the parts of the body and how the different parts of the body worked. And they actually had that game picked up and somebody wanted to publish the game. For wow. The yeah, I remember that. Idea. I remember that. Yep. Yeah. So this is a real thing. Like it's a real process. This is really how you go about making stuff, something. And, you know, I don't, I don't think everybody is interested in making their own game. But certainly, the notion of utilizing an existing game um, is 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 certainly there. And understanding what a game can bring into a classroom learning paradigm is is really important. Um, and so, so I hope that we covered at least a number of things that were useful in that regard. Yeah. Well, thank you. Sure. And uh, we'll probably have to have you on in the fall for for an, a, another session because. We we went we breezed through a lot of really important material. Well, but yeah, this was, I, <laughs> this was great. Okay.
Well, I, I greatly appreciate it. Let me um, let me end the slideshow here. Okay, um, and if you're gonna and then you're gonna stop the showing stop the share. Right, here we go. I, switch it back to you now. And I'm gonna just share one thing because if people are interested, um, you know, edgeinteractive.org is mm -hmm. how you you got here. Um, we're having actually two more next week. One is kind of the begin another aspect of game design, which is the, the technical part of it, you know, how you can um, string together resources in order to make a micro learning app. It's not a deep game, but um, you know, it's, it's the first step. And then also on a completely different subject, uh, a lot of you know, kids, well, and their parents and a lot of us are stressing out over the coronavirus. And so um, Ralph Singh, is going to be having a session on stories that help you calm students during these times. And they, they also uh, work to calm you. So um, so those are two events that we're having next week. Uh, these are all free. So uh, feel free to join us or to let, let people know about them. And um, I'm going to stop sharing now and just say thank you, know, thank you again, Chris. And I'll see you in Florida in June. Oops, um, we are. I, mean, yeah. <laughs> I, mute. I was typing furiously, so I, I muted myself. Hey, you, thank you everyone for, for coming out. I, I, I'm looking at the comments and everything. No one's telling me to, uh, you know, jump off a cliff. So that's great. I appreciate that. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I love talking about this stuff. So anything I could do to help is, is great. Well, it was great. It was fantastic. I really, okay. I, I always learn. Yeah, you know, I always enjoy talking with you and I always learn something. So yeah. th thanks again. I feel like we were kind of at a conference having a hallway conversation almost, except I had right. a slide deck. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay, so okay. Uh, this is Mitch Weisberg. I'll sign off for EdChat Interactive. Hope to see some of you at Serious Play or online. And have a good evening, everybody. Stay, stay healthy. <laughs>